Welcome to another episode of The Unseen Paranormal, where some of the scariest things are unseen. I'm your host, Eric Freeman. Hey everybody, welcome back to the show. Today we have the unofficial co-host of The Unseen Paranormal. We're going to kick off season two with Mr. Alan Searcy. He started off season one with us, so we're going to start off season two with him as well. He is the, if you don't know him by now, he is the host, co-host of the Southern Ghost Stories podcast, and he is the author of the Southern Ghost Stories series of books. His newest book just came out a few weeks ago called Southern Ghost Stories, Franklin, Tennessee. I've been excited about this one. How's it going, Alan? It's good, man. Thanks for having me back on. I uh, No problem. Like I said, you're now the unofficial co-host because you've been on so many times. I'm the Tom Hanks of the Unseen Paranormal. <laughs> just in everything. So you finally got the Franklin book written, which I'm excited about because that's, of course, where I grew up and around this area and uh, had lots of experiences in Franklin. You actually uh, make a cameo in the book from what I understand. I do. A couple of times. We uh, we yeah. investigated uh, Lote's house. I'm in that section of the book. And then uh, one of my stories from uh, Carton Plantation. But uh, talking about the book, about Franklin, Franklin is, I would say, probably, if not the most haunted town, one of the most haunted towns in Tennessee. And uh, because of the long history, of course, of uh, of the Civil War battle, the huge battle of Franklin, and then also you've had fires like lots of other small towns we've talked about, like with the Gallatin and Murfreesboro, shootings and lynchings and all this other craziness going on in Franklin. Yeah, it's definitely got its share of uh, all of the above. Yeah. You kind of went street by street in downtown Franklin, because downtown Franklin is the historic side of Franklin. The the Cool Springs, what it would all the locals refer to as cool springs kind of the newer stuff there's not i guess as much of the haunting on the haunting side out there because that used to be a big farm but um yeah most of the i guess most of the hauntings and stuff are are downtown and kind of in a couple square mile radius well i mean there are stories from the mall area but i've kind of i'm saving that for a later date yeah i mean you gotta think when they had to fought the battle of franklin you know they marched the confederacy marched from Riverville and spring hill all the way down Columbia Pike to basically the Carter House. Uh, they had 20,000 Confederates, roughly 20,000 Federal soldiers. They were entrenched there. So uh, General Hood, who was upset, the Union kind of got the best of them and evaded his forces that night or the night before. They uh, He he ordered a full frontal assault. You know, you have 20,000 men marching right and there's 20,000 entrenched men. You know, it's going to lead to a lot of uh, death and destruction and mostly from the Confederate side. So, you know, after they fought right there around the Carter House on Columbia Pike, the Union marched back up into downtown Franklin, and in a few hours, they retreated back to Nashville. So technically, the Confederacy won the Battle of Franklin. So they took the battlefield. But after the war, after the fighting was uh, finished, all those houses and buildings and businesses there in downtown Franklin became hospitals. So I think it was like 10 to 1, like it was a soldier-to-citizen ratio that night. So if you had a house there in Franklin, you're just minding your own business, you get a knock at the door, and you get a couple of soldiers – in your house being treated by uh, Confederate surgeons. So it's just, uh, it was a bad night. And it just, the whole town of Franklin, it's just, everything's haunted pretty much because of that. Yeah. And it's crazy how just that one, one 24 hour period kind of shaped this entire little town and with the hauntings and the history. Yeah. And then once you get through the war and you go to reconstruction, it's like Gallatin and Murfreesboro and Nashville, New Orleans, Chicago, it, poor fire codes, everything's made of wood whole square you have wooden buildings everywhere it's like you have a, a business downstairs and the family dwelling upstairs upstairs you have a stove and multiple candles you know one spark like the whole block on fire it happened everywhere uh, happened to franklin several times so you had main street burning down and over on third avenue you have all those real old stately homes that belong to prominent business people and lots of stories and legends from uh peggy eaton and just there's a whole lot of stories on third avenue as well as main street yeah, and you included you included some of the interesting history in there too, not just the haunting stuff, which is I like to hear about the weird history as well. Um, one of the ones that really caught my attention was the I, I like to call it the Doctor Frankenstein of Franklin. Yeah, that, that was kind of my favorite story too. It's uh, I, it kind of came out of nowhere. I was looking through the archives and I found some stuff about a guy who was uh, trying to revive bodies, and I started digging and digging. And back in 1830s, that happened a lot. Uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein was published. You got all these doctors and scientists who wanted to see if they could do it too. So uh, the guy was Dr. Ferdinand Stith. His office is actually where the courthouse is today. He made a deal with the lawmakers or the politicians in town. After hangings, 
he would go retrieve the bodies and either out there in the field or back in his office, he would try to revive them. And he was successful. He would uh, hook up electric current, I think, to the temples and uh, start the power and he'd get a pulse. But, you know, after he got the pulse, he'd just let them wither away and die again. But uh, he was successful in reviving bodies there in Franklin. But you know what? In Franklin, you had that get pockets all over the United States and over in Europe, too. Yeah, and kind of popularized by Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, like you were saying. It was kind of the one of those weird Victorian uh, kind of uh, 19th century things. And something else about uh, uh, Dr. Stith I found, he was kind of an odd guy. In addition to the Frankenstein stuff, he also had a goat with one eye that he would show people in the media and the press, and he liked the attention of, I guess, being a weird guy. <laughs> kind of eccentric, as people would say. Yeah. And the, uh, you were talking about his house is where the uh, courthouse is now. There's a lot of stuff uh, in the public square right around the courthouse, a lot of those buildings and a lot of history there. Oh, yeah. I mean, that courthouse is occupied by federal forces during the war, of course, and uh, supposedly they're hanging people also right outside the courthouse. You had uh, people who were lynched all over the, the courthouse balcony. Uh, there was a quote-unquote race riot that took place after the war near Reconstruction. It, they call it a race riot, but you had black and white men on both sides fighting. So, it's, uh, yeah, there's a whole lot of history there at the courthouse, and it's all over the square and Main Street there in Franklin. So the uh, courthouse is also haunted by a few different entities that have been uh, reported there throughout the years. Yeah, it's funny. While I was researching the book, um, I got to tour with a deputy, and he was walking around telling me stories and um he was telling me now he was downstairs, like the level that you can't really go into. Actually, something I didn't really cover in the book, but supposedly there are tunnels under the square, like there are in Murfreesboro and Nashville and other cities in Tennessee. And he's talking about how he was down there in that basement where the tunnels are, and he heard like a sound of buffalo just running overhead. And he ran upstairs, and there was nothing going on. Uh, he told me a story about how he was. Um, Court was in session one day, and they used to hold prisoners back there behind the judges' uh, chambers. Well, he said this guy just started yelling and just cussing, making a bunch of noise. And they went back there and said, hey, you need to quiet down. And court's in session. He's like, man, there's an old guy back here telling me to get out. So there's a lot of weird and creepy stuff that happened. And it's just it's funny the deputies still talk about it. And they tell me that sometimes they go ghost hunting in there. Little amateur ghost hunts from some of the deputies. Mm -hmm. And actually, I took an empath in there with me when I did the tour, and he was telling me that like he felt like everybody was just watching him. Like there were multiple people in there, and then we walked in. He said it was like court was in session. They were sitting in the pews, and everybody just turned around to look at to look at us when we came in there. Wow! And then also, also outside on the balcony, there's been quite a few stories of people seeing uh, apparitions up on the balcony at the of the courthouse. That's what they say. They say they've seen soldiers kind of pacing back and forth like they're on patrol. But that balcony is also where uh, I think it was Amos Miller was the gentleman's name who was lynched. Um, he was a black man accused of uh, doing something with a white woman, and he never went to trial. But when he got to well, he was on his way to trial when a bunch of people attacked him, and and they hung hung him right there over the courthouse banister. Yeah, so just a huge history downtown. Another building that is I thought was really interesting. In the book is uh, Grace Pharmacy on Main Street, and that has a long history of, of a bunch of different stuff as well. Yeah, they say that, that the servers, they see and hear things on the staircase and over there at the host, hostess stand that they've had things go on over there. Back in the 1800s, that's where a guy named Jesse Bliss, that's what, that was his grocery store. And he's one of the guys who was involved in the race riot. And uh, he was just kind of a bad guy. He was always causing problems. And they ran him out of Franklin to Nashville and he got thrown in jail in Nashville. But yeah, that Graves has a long history even before it was Graves. But it was a grocery, it was a grocery and drug store um, back in the day. It became a drug store. Uh, now it's a restaurant. But yeah, everybody who works there has stories. Sit in the basement. They've heard people call people's names down there in the basement. It's just it's a really cool, creepy old building. And with all the modern businesses downtown Franklin now, you have like the Baskin Robbins is haunted. You have the White Building, which is also the Five Points Building, which has Starbucks in it. And you got some reports from the people that work at Starbucks. Yeah, that white building, that's one of my favorite chapters in the, in the book because I went out there for the investigation. So I went over there and working on the book. And at Starbucks, people were saying, oh, yeah, there's a drummer boy in the basement. You go next door to the uh, eye doctor. And they're like, yeah, we think here's a uh, soldier in our basement. And you go next door to the mattress store. And they're like, there's something in the basement. But I don't know what it is. So I worked out where I could do an investigation there. I went with Clark Walsh, Professor of the County Paranormal. And we hooked up with the eye doctor. And we went to their basement one evening. 
So we're down there, we're down there for 10, 15 minutes, and nothing's going on. We can't get anything established. So I get bored, and I put on the bottom of the Republic on my cell phone, on YouTube. And as soon as I do, the meters just start going nuts. So we're down there for a little bit, and it kind of tapers off. So we go upstairs to an office where things have been known to happen. So nothing's going on. I do the same thing. Pull up my phone, the Battle Hymn of the Republic, you know, one of the songs the Federal Army would march to, and all the meters just go nuts. So while we're up there, Mark has a geoport. And Wendy, who works in the building, she goes, what's your name? And out of the geoport goes, Drake. She said, did you say Blake or Drake? And it went, Drake. A second time. So when he once again goes, did you say Drake? And it said, yes. So just three confirmations right there. That was just really cool. So I go home and I'm, I'm researching, I'm Googling Battle of Franklin casualties, Drake. And like one of the first things pops up is a soldier named Thomas Jefferson Drake. He was in the 10th Ohio. And he died in the Battle of Franklin. But the kicker was he was a drummer. And if you go to findagrave.com, you can see his family has put a picture of his drum right there along with his picture. So it makes me think, if we're down there in the basement and just nothing happens, I started playing a song he made March to and played, maybe that's why he responded to us. It's just really cool. I mean, Thomas Jefferson Drake. I mean, what are the odds that you get the Drake and then you find out he was a drummer who died in Dallas Franklin? But you just go back right. before the White Building, that was uh, Robert Bradley's home. He was a prominent businessman. Well, of course, that night of the battle, that would have been a hospital. So... Maybe Robert Drake was being treated for his injuries there at the Drake at the uh, Bradley House, and he died from his injuries there. There are also some stories that we heard when we investigated the Lodes House about some activity with the drum that they have in one of their cases. Yeah, I've heard I've heard them talk about that. They said that uh, they'll hear like somebody tapping on it, and well, you and I were there for an investigation back. In, I think it was like August of last year, and the story kind of involves you. We, I was in the music room because the whole night I didn't get a whole lot of activity. But you had walked outside with your cousin, and I was in the music room just kind of walking around with my EMF meter. I hear like a boom, like someone threw a brick at the side of the building. And so I walked down the hallway, and I saw some other uh, investigators, and I said, hey, did you guys hear that? And the lady's like, oh, yeah, it sounded like somebody threw a rock at the wall. So I went outside, and I saw you. I said, hey, you know, what are you guys doing? I'm like, oh, we're just smoking. I said, you've been in your car. Yeah, we closed our car door a few minutes ago, but you guys had parked around the back of the building and not on the side of the building where I heard the noise. Yeah. So that was like a really weird coincidence. And also, I think upstairs, you and your cousin saw a lady, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I caught I caught movement out of the corner of my eye, and my cousin looked at the same time that I kind of turned around, but he saw across the hallway into another room a full-bodied apparition. He said it looked like a lady in a white dress on the other side of the bed, in between the bed and the window. And, um, she kind of walked just the, the only field of view that he had was kind of the doorway and she walked across his field of view. And once she got the other side of the doorway, she was gone. And it's, and he said something right away and we ran over there to make sure, because like you said, there's other investigators with us and there was nobody over there. And none of the ladies that were in the house investigating had been in that area. Most people were downstairs. So yeah, it was pretty interesting. Yeah. I think everybody was outside smoking when that happened. Yeah. Yeah, I think it was just uh, there were a couple of investigators in the back of the house, and we were the three of us were in the front when that happened. And it was crazy because my cousin Brian, it was his first paranormal investigation ever. So for him to see the holy grail of a full body apparition was pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't. I didn't see an apparition that night. I did some weird things with the ram pod, if I, I remember correctly. Yeah, the ram pod was going off when nobody was upstairs, and I ran upstairs to check it out. And um, it was in the middle of the hallway, hadn't gone off all night, and that was the only time it ever went off. I remember when we first got there, we were downstairs, like the orientation, they were giving the spiel and the history of the house. And somebody said, hey, who's upstairs? And the, the guy there was like, there's nobody upstairs. And like, you could hear footsteps just kind of pacing back and forth. I thought that was kind of neat. Yeah, and they also report, um, specifically, I think it was a spittoon that's up in one of the rooms upstairs that moves around on its own. If if they move it out of where it's supposed to be, I guess where the spirits think it's supposed to be, it moves moves itself back and moves around. Yeah, one of the associates there at the house, he was showing me pictures of he'll come in, in the morning and then find things just thrown on the floor or stuff scattered or things moved around. I mean, it happens all the time over there. I was actually joking with him and they were telling me, yeah, we should write our own book to spell the Lotes House. Yeah, and Thomas, the the director, he used to be uh, work at the Carter House across the street and. He told us that, you know, he never really believed in the paranormal until he went to work at the Lotes house. And uh, he kind of took it over during the pandemic. And he 
spend hours showing video and, and telling stories about stuff that's happened to him just in the short time that he's been there. Oh yeah, he his phone is just full of pictures and videos of a lot of things that happened. And Thomas, he's a really nice guy. I mean, that guy's forgotten more about Battle Franklin than I'll ever know. That guy's just a wealth of information. Yeah, he's a he's a great tour guide. If any of y'all have ever ever in Franklin, you definitely got to go to the tour at the Lotes House. Between him and Chuck, they are both just could tell you anything you want to know about the Battle of Franklin. And yeah, Chuck's an interesting guy. He worked at Ripa Villa for years. He worked at Carter House, just like Thomas. I mean, yeah, Chuck and. And Thomas are both very knowledgeable guys and great guides for anybody who wants to visit the Lotes House. And going back to the big, the big loud bang that you heard, one of the interesting things about the Lotes House, too, was I think it was two cannonballs came through the roof during the battle. Mm-hmm. And there's still a burn mark in the what's now the gift shop floor that you can see. And so I just wonder if it's some sort of residual that you heard from when that happened, you know, 200 years ago. I mean, that's a possibility. I don't know. It just it, it was distinct, and it sounded like a brick that had been thrown at the side of the house. It just it's hard to say, man, but I'll never forget that night. Yeah, it was a pretty cool night. Like I said with my cousin, seeing the full-by apparition, you having that experience, and and uh, just a very cool place to, to investigate. Yeah, for if sure. we stuck around a little bit longer, we could have uh, gone down there in the in the basement. They were doing some stuff down there, and I like to go there and excavate and just kind of dig around because they've been kind of slowly working on that down there and who knows the family lived down there all the houses being used as a hospital so i'm sure there's lots of just really cool stuff just waiting to be unearthed yeah and that's uh lowe's house is on columbia pike as you were saying across the street from the carter house and it seems like all of those businesses around there i know thomas before you even wrote your book thomas had told us stories about the garage next door and i think you got some stories from them it's a it's a mechanic shop next door to lowe's house Mm-hmm. And uh, I think you got some stories in the book from there as well, from some of those guys experiencing some weird stuff. Yeah, it was funny. I walked over there. I've been in the Lowe's house, just kind of talking to Chuck and hanging out. And I walked over to the mechanic shop next door, and I was like, you know, I just wonder, you know, is your property haunted too? And he's like, man, you know, I'll come in some mornings and I'll look and I'll see people sitting in the cars that I'm about to work on. And I'll do a double take and turn back, and they're gone. And it's funny because there's also next door to him was another auto body shop. And they say the same thing. If you're working on cars, look up and see Ben just kind of walk and pace back and forth. And they'll turn around and they'll still be gone. So it, the guy who owns the shop was telling me, like, there were two different guys who came to him at different times. They didn't work together. Like, one worked there in the 80s, one worked in the 90s. And they both like, hey, is this place haunted? I keep seeing things. And while the owner said he didn't, hadn't seen it, two people who stayed there late at night hadn't seen the same thing. That whole area, like we're talking about, you know, this is right off the square, Columbia Pike. And. Even AutoZone over there has stories. The employees have stories of the hauntings. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's just where they fought, man. I mean, that's where, you know, 20,000 men went head-to-head with 20,000 other men. It's just a weird corner of the universe for something really bad happened, and there's something there because of it. And then across the street from the Lotes House is the Carter House, which uh, you kind of used the image on the cover of the book of the bullet holes in the in the wall that are still there. Yeah, I actually had, like, different versions of the cover and I wanted to do like the inside of that Carter office because it's like pitch black with the bullet holes but I kept hearing it's like something like from outer space so I didn't use that but yeah that's a really if you haven't been to the Carter house you should really go especially to see that farmhouse or that that office that Mr. Carter had it's just riddled with bullet holes and it just kind of tells the story of what happened there that day and now it's just like Carton they won't talk about the hauntings but you talk to lady who was the director for like 20 years and uh she gave you lots of stories about the carter house yeah it, it's funny uh the carter house and also ripa villa and uh Carton are owned by the battlefield of franklin trust and i've been hearing things that they'll discipline you or you can get fired they don't talk about that kind of stuff they don't want to be associated with it so but you can still talk to people who have worked there or you know i took a tour one day and somebody from the Carter house is telling me a story about something happened at Carton. So they kind of do whisper about it, but uh, you talk to the wrong person, they'll shut you down pretty quick. But I mean, you, you just have to think all the death and destruction happened on at the Carter house and Carton. There are ghost stories there. You just got to really dig for them. Yeah. One of the, uh, one of the other places that caught my attention was Clouston hall, which is now a art gallery, gallery 202. And there's still blood stains in that house as well. But um, there's some interesting stories uh, from Clausen Hall. Yeah, that's a really cool place. It was a townhouse for a guy who was a uh, he, he developed real estate back in the 1800s, and he got in financial trouble and had to sell it. There's like multiple stories that go with it. 
yeah, of course, it was used as a hospital during the Civil War. There's a gruesome blood stain on the floor by the window in the front parlor down there if you ever go inside. But the art gallery, the owner, Kelly Harwood's a really friendly guy, and they got some beautiful artwork in there. So if you were down in Franklin you want to check it out, I recommend you do so. But there's a lot of uh, history on that house. Uh, a lot of soldiers from, uh, I think it was Missouri, were treated there after the battle. A lot of them died there. Supposedly they were stacking the bodies under the house because it was really cold that night. Also, after the war, the house belonged to Dr. Daniel Cliff. Well, his mother, Miss Nini, she came to live there with him when she got older and was in poor health. Well, the story of Miss Nini is she was a staunch Confederate supporter. She she got in trouble for burning bridges that you know try to keep the Union out of Franklin, and she also took pot shots out of uh, Adam out of a window with her gun. But one night she she saw one walking outside, so she went to her window and set her sights on him, and she pulled the trigger on the gun and. The gun backfired and blew her thumb off. So she wore a glove the rest of her life to kind of hide that. She put like some cotton up in the in the glove part of the thumb of the glove to kind of hide her disfigurement. And that's, that's how she lived the rest of her life with that glove on. Well, back when they opened the art gallery a few years ago, one of the gentlemen was upstairs. And uh, well, actually, the guy who owned it, he rented out. He had orders that would come stay with him. So one of the guys was staying up there. And he woke up in the middle of the night, and there was a lady in bed with him, and she's wearing a glove. So he ran out of there screaming and told the guy, like, hey, pack my bags. I'll come by and get them in a few hours. But that's a story. Say, Miss Nanny's up there. When I was researching the book, I went upstairs and had my digital recorder, my EMF meter, and I got a really strange sound. It sounded like something was scratching the wall when I was up asking questions. You know, it could have been a mouse, but it sounded a lot harder than that. But I didn't really put it in the book because I didn't know what it was, and it's kind of easy to dispel. Yeah. You know, hey, it's a mouse or it's, you know, a, a squirrel up in the attic or something. But, yeah, the Clouston Hall is just a, it's a really cool place, and it's got multiple ghost stories. And another story is there was a lady who she was supposedly the daughter of Mr. Clouston. And when Mr. Clouston began having financial problems, he made a deal with a local businessman to marry his daughter off to him. You know, he'd been like in his 40s or 50s, and he's going to marry a teenager. But the marriage would have benefited Mr. Clouston. It kind of helped him out of his, his pickle he was in. But the young lady, night before the wedding, decided she couldn't go through with it. She hung herself there in the house from the banister. And I've talked to one guy who told me he's seen a woman dangling there. He walked in when he was in high school. And there's a lady, before they told the story, he was telling the, the tour guy from the ghost tour, hey, there's a lady like right here. And they take a picture, and there's like a purple hue right where he's saying, I saw a lady. Wow. And he's not the only one. Most people have said they've seen a lady hanging there. Uh, a lot of them are kids. So that's there are like three different ghost stories at Klaus and Hall. Yeah, that place was, was really cool. Me and you, uh, I joined you uh, a couple weeks ago on the Franklin on Foot ghost tour. And uh, that was probably my favorite place that we went to that night. Yeah, it's even cooler when you can go inside. Yeah, yeah, I'll have to go in there and check out the art and the and talk to the owner about the the hauntings at some point in time. If you go in, like right there in the hallway, you can see where a cannonball went through the roof and uh, came to rest there on the floor. It's still, you got the burn marks where it came to rest there in the hallway. Yeah, that's uh, one of my favorite stories in the book, uh, especially Miss Ninny with <laughs> blowing her thumb off. And uh, then that guy woke up with a lady with gloves on in the bed and didn't even know the story about Miss Ninny. So that's that's yeah, pretty well. – It's it's always awesome when you have that correlation of people – um, that you can directly tie it back to somebody that, you know, you can prove lived in history. Well, I, I found the obituary where Miss Nanny, she died in the house, and then they held her funeral in the house a few days later. So, I mean, I've got it documented. You know, I could try to tie things up and, you know, put it all together, and that's I did with that newspaper article in the obituary. Uh, another building I've always been intrigued by in Franklin is the Hiram Lodge, and it's the old oldest continually occupied uh, Mason Lodge in Tennessee. And uh, just the, a wealth of history just for the building, not even the hauntings, but just the building itself. Yeah, that's a building that, you know, when I wrote the book, it was during the, the quote-unquote pandemic, and it was hard, you know, getting in touch with people or catching people in the right place at the right time. And, and I never really have to go in there. You know, I've been by it a thousand times, and I kind of just a lot on secondhand stories and things that were told by me for people I respect. But I didn't get to go in the building to actually – do an investigate or anything because of the pandemic. I think the the biggest story that I've heard about Hiram Lodge is a is a soldier is seen a Civil War era soldier is seen in there a lot. 
Yeah, that's the that's the story. The uh, there's a sol- actually I think there's multiple soldiers, but usually it's children that see them. Uh, the kids will go in there on a, on a Girl Scout t- trip, or or a school group will go in there and they'll ask the teacher, "Hey, you know, what's that guy doing in that soldier costume?" That's, I heard that from multiple people that it's kids that usually see a soldier in there. And that's kind of a, a story that I've heard around Franklin my entire life of people always will think because Franklin does lots of reenactments. Uh, throughout the year and and so you'll have people walk around franklin in costume but there's many stories around franklin of people thinking that it's a reenactor and they'll come to find out that there's no reenactors around that day yeah it's funny out that the book's out like people you know i I had to chase people down for these ghost stories for the book now the book's out people are coming to me i was at the book signing at landmark booksellers back last weekend and this guy's like man i was out walking my dog at two o'clock in the morning and uh, i walked over to the hotel which is behind the landmark booksellers and he's like, I saw a guy like walking down the hall of the hotel, like in the hallway there, and he walked through the door, and then he was gone. I'm like, well, I mean, you just don't know, man. That's after the battle, they all came up here, and you know, I believe you. Yeah. Um, another place that we went on the on the Franklin on Foot Ghost Tour was the Cherry Manor or the Perkins House, and that's got some interesting history as well. Yeah, that's a really cool place. Um, that's an, that's the one place where like everybody has a story, or they say that. They've seen things or heard things or they see a lady in the window or a girl in the window. And you just hear all these stories. And the really cool thing for me was the guy who actually owned the building, he was a Confederate soldier. Well, he escaped seven times. They capture him, he'd get out. They capture him again, he'd get out. And he finally got out and became a prominent businessman. But, uh, yeah, they say that's, that building is haunted by a girl. It's really cool. If you go there and look at it, you can actually see on the window where it was used as a – a girl's school for a short time when the girls were called fire. But the girls who were there, if they got something like a diamond or whatever, and they cut their names into the glass. And you still see it on the uh, window there if you're, uh, I guess, to the right of the front door. But yeah, they said they hear doors closing. They see, uh, they hear footsteps, all kinds of weird things like that. And right next door to Cherry Manor is, uh, is that it's now a hair salon, but you and Mark did an investigation there too, right? Yeah, that was really weird. Um, we had his geoport going, and we kept hearing, we kept getting signals it was a soldier. So finally, I was like, it's soldier, what's your name? And out of the corner of the room, we hear a whisper, Sarah. And actually, I picked it up on my digital recorder. I still have it. But you know, the whole time we think we're talking to a soldier, and a lady in the room let us know her name was Sarah. But the story there, it's supposed to be a lady named Sarah, and we're not really sure what happened, but legend has it that she, someone pushed her down the stairs. But in there, they say, like, lights will go off and on. Uh, a former associate actually came in early one morning and saw a a flowing white dress standing there in the hallway. And, like, she, they have her on camera standing there for, like, two minutes trying to process what she was looking at before she ran out the door. But the even creepier thing was the owner told me that the lady said when she got back to her car and she called him, the spirit there went to the window and was watching her through the window. <laughs> that was really <laughs> Another another interesting story uh, is Clayton Veach. Yeah, and it's not a ghost story. It's just yeah. it's this guy that they put him in jail and like they couldn't they couldn't keep him. I think the statistic was his first sixteen times he was arrested and thrown in jail, he escaped nine times. Uh, my father in law actually knew him. My father in law was a deputy in Davidson County, and and uh, they call him Rabbit. They had him Rabbit because they couldn't catch him. They, they couldn't hold him. But he was in jail up in Sumner County, Williamson County, Davidson County. He was his thing was like steal cars. He never hurt anybody. He'd just steal a car and just take off with it. But yeah, he would get in jail and he would cut his wrist or, or he'd stick a pen in his hand and, and prick himself and tell the the person, the deputy there watching him that he would. They swallow the pen. They rush him to the hospital and he he escaped from the hospital. It's kind of funny that there's a big scandal with Williamson County Jail in the. I guess it was the mid 20th century and rabbit was such just a well-known guy. They let him leave at night and he would come back. So uh, during that scandal where the jailer, he got an inmate pregnant once all that happened and they locked rabbit and the whole jail back down and he couldn't get, get out. But yeah, Clayton beach is not a ghost story, but I just thought it was so cool. I had to. to yeah. Yeah. Pretty interesting guy and a pretty interesting story surrounding him. One of the awesome things I like you did with the book, specifically with this one, and also it's the way that, that Franklin was built because the whole downtown is everybody's got a story in every building, but you can actually do your own kind of ghost tour just by taking your book downtown because you have the addresses in there and people can actually see where all these stories happened and 
possibly go in and talk to some of the people and get their own uh, accounts, firsthand accounts. Yeah, well, when I did the Gallatin book a couple of years ago, I started to put the business's name. But I started thinking, you know, on these squares, the business has changed like every year or two. So I just put the address. So you, you can. You can walk down Main Street or you can go down 3rd Avenue or 4th Avenue or Columbia Pike and you, know, you can pop in and say, hey, I've heard this place is haunted. And nine times out of ten, they'll tell you the ghost stories. They'll tell you what they've seen or heard. And you might catch somebody else who I didn't talk to who will tell you a whole different story that's not in the book. That's kind of the, the cool thing about it. Yeah, and I like how, how it's kind of changed where – a lot of these people were more open to talk about it as well. I know at one time in Franklin, uh, back when I was growing up, I mean, you'd hear, I'd hear stories and whispers of the hauntings, but you could never get anybody to talk to you about it. But now with, you know, it being in pop culture and kind of mainstream, you get, everybody wants to talk about it now. Yeah. It's more accepted than it was probably 10, 20 years ago. And especially in October and now they have ghost tours and, you know, those businesses, they work with those ghost tour people. So, I mean, it kind of benefits them to be more open to it. And with the pandemic last year, places like the Lowe's House, they really had to embrace it because they were down, I think, 70% from the year before with their uh, their numbers. Yeah, so it really helped them keep the doors open because they they rely on that, you know, people just coming in off the streets to, to take the tours, and they that's where their money comes from. Yeah, I mean, they would never allow investigations five years ago, but because the pandemic and the numbers were just so bad, they had to do something. That's why we got to go in there last year. Yeah, we could sit here for the next few hours and talk about the hauntings in Franklin because um, there's just so much. I mean, the story about Peggy Eaton and that scandal, Betty Berg. You got the factory, what we all know around here is the factory, um, which was an old uh, stove factory, but they made, what, uh, cast iron pot belly stoves? Yeah, and that's something that when I started working on the books, I'm like, oh, the, the factory's haunted. And I've been to the factory, you know, two, three dozen times growing up or over the past few years. And it's like, that factory's not haunted. It wasn't a house. No one lived there. But I started talking to a lady. She's like, oh, yeah, nobody lived here, but somebody fell uh, from the second floor into a big vat of hot boiling iron. I'm like, well, that'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they say that the security crews, they – they see things on the cameras and they'll hear things like somebody's walking behind them. It's a lot of cool stuff like that. But yeah, that's a really cool story. Somebody falling into a big hot vat of iron. Well, for everybody that doesn't know the factory in Franklin, they've turned into like this big indoor kind of mall. Um, and, it, but it's not like big name stores. It's, it's restaurants and it's a lot of, um, mom and pop shops and, and people with, uh, doing different crafts and stuff like that. It's really cool, really cool place. And they do uh live music there. And if you've ever seen the CMT crossroads, they actually film it in a, in a sound stage there. Yeah, it's a really cool place. You can go by and a lot of boutiques and a lot of local businesses, like you said, and they have some good food there. It's, you know, go on a Saturday afternoon and make a day of it. Yeah. Kind of antique mall in there. And yeah, and you can't, you can't miss it because they still got the big giant water tower outside, which I think is kind of cool. And they've got some other outbuildings that have other businesses in them, but yeah, very cool place. Mm -hmm. But yeah, like I said, we could sit here all day and talk about, you know, my experiences at Carton and, you know, your experiences and all the stories that we've heard, but uh, people just need to go pick up the book because it is the way that you write the history and then bring in the hauntings. I just think is awesome. Like I said, people can take the book downtown Franklin park and you can walk around for, you know, the whole day and check out these different places. You can see the, like Alan was saying, the cherry mansion, the girl's names etched in the glass. And then we didn't even talk about chef's music, but chef's music has a handprint on the um, glass above the door that the story is that every time they wash it off, the handprint comes back and they don't know where it came from. But chef's music is, there's lots of stories with that too, but just all kinds of history and so many hauntings from all the shootings, lynchings, fires, the war, just a huge history in Franklin. It's just a cool place to go walk around downtown anyway, because everything's old. And we didn't talk about the murders around town. Yeah. Yeah. The murders right out in the streets. You wrote about quite a few of those, but yeah, so many interesting stories. Um, also, your book has been number one on Amazon, which is awesome. Congratulations on that. Thank you. Yeah, it's a nice surprise. Yeah, it's been pretty popular. So I can't wait for the next one. We'll have you back on. You'll be co-host again. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah, someone sent me a screenshot like, hey, you're number one on Amazon. Uh, and then, I mean, that was cool. But the, the best accolade I've got, somebody called me a from Franklin, his story, and somebody I really respect. And they're telling me how much they enjoyed the book. And they're like, I didn't know about this. I didn't know about that. It's somebody who lived in Franklin and has grown up in Franklin and knows Franklin a lot more than me. And I'm you know, reading my stories and I'm like, oh, my God, I never knew this. So that's probably the best compliment I've got so far is from 
uh, historian who really enjoyed it. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. And of course, they can find your book on Amazon, on Kindle, all of your books on Amazon and Kindle. And uh, you have them in a few physical locations. Yes, sir. Uh, Landmark booksellers down there on the square in Franklin. And of course, a spooky pickle. Our friend Sean out there at Pickle Treats and Antiques in Gallatin, Tennessee. All right, Alan, thank you so much for coming on again today. I'm sure we'll see each other here soon, do another investigation. Yes, sir. Sounds great. All right, everybody. Thank you for listening. As always, stay safe out there. Join us next time for a new episode of The Unseen Paranormal. Until then, head over to The Unseen Paranormal Lounge on Facebook for all the latest updates and discussions about the show. You can also find us on Instagram, Twitter, or at unseenparanormalpodcast.com. And please rate, review, share, and subscribe to help more people discover the show. The Unseen Paranormal Podcast is proud to be the ambassador for paranormal for verbal.com. A big thank you to my friend Chris Lips for the awesome theme music. You can find more of his music on Apple, Amazon, or Spotify. And as always, thank you for listening.